I I am going to talk today on the uh, on the on my presentation on uh, MNA uh, legal challenges uh, uh, during the post COVID uh, situation uh, rather, and I am conscious of the fact that these are for law students, so I am going to keep it very very basic and and preliminary discussion and uh, more for helping the students and also the young lawyers so that all those who desire to become uh, MNA lawyer or become want to become corporate lawyers. Uh, they get some uh, uh, some idea of of when you become a corporate lawyer, what exactly and how you really can, uh, you know, uh, work as a as a corporate lawyer. Uh, so I'm I'm uh, again I, I I'm also assuming that uh, uh, students are from the first year, second year, or third year, and and many of you may not have uh, the opportunity to learn Companies Act as a subject. So uh, I'll have to make some basic assumptions. Otherwise, you know, it will become difficult for me to really cover the canvas. Uh, so I, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to talk technically too much, but I'm going to really give you the practical aspect of becoming a corporate lawyer. And particularly once you become a corporate lawyer, uh, in in that cop, in that field itself, how do you handle the M&A space? Uh, how do you work on the mergers and acquisitions uh, space, which I've been working in the last uh, 20, 26 years now? Uh, so very quickly, uh, when we talk of a mergers and acquisitions. Uh, it, it is not just the court process uh, merger or acquisition that we talk. We talk of uh, mergers and amalgamation, demergers, capital restructuring, reduction of capital. We talk of scheme of arrangements between a company on one hand and the creditors on the other hand. We talk of scheme of arrangement between the company, the debtors. We talk also uh, a lot of combination uh, um, uh, can happen in, in under the scheme of arrangements or compromise. Then, we are, then MA also uh, brings into its fold uh, the asset sale, business sale, share purchase agreement, share transfers agreement. So, essentially, any these are the various forms in which any merger or amalgamation takes place. Um, now, very broadly, you need to understand there are two classifications of any MA. So, on one hand, we are uh, the, the two broad classification is MA of a listed company versus MA of an unlisted company. So, the treatment for a listed company is slightly different procedurally and treatment for an unlisted company uh, doing an MA for an unlisted company is slightly different, which is uh, less of process or less of approvals, I would say. So the first divide is you need to understand that MA for a listed space, listed companies is completely is different in, in terms of process. And whereas when it comes to unlisted company, it is slightly different. That's the first divide you need to understand. Second divide now coming uh, uh, in the MNA space, MN, the, and the mergers and acquisition itself. Again, there are there is a further two divide. Uh, the divide is whether you want to do an MNA through a court process or you don't want to do it through court process. Now, if you want to do through it through a court process, then the current uh, section 230 of the Indian Companies Act, Companies Act 2013, and earlier 391 under the 1956 Act. So uh, the whole host of the whole chapter governs the court process and if you don't wish to go uh, do an m a through court process you you, are, you also also have a possibility of doing do by a contractual arrangement for example to give you a classic example is if you want to acquire a company you could merge that company into your own company or you could merge your company into another company by way of a scheme of merger or an amalgamation as, as we call versus on the other hand if you don't wish to go to court or through a court route you could also you could also acquire the shares of that company and simplicity or make it your subsidiary or you could sell your shares to that company and you could be your company could become subsidiary of that company this is the other form now this this transfer of shares doesn't need any court approval it, it falls outside the court approval the third third uh, way of doing any merger or amalgamation is essentially when you merge or amalgamate a company so what do you do so you really take the uh, business operations and you merge that business operations means one whole, entire company gets merged into other company now you could also remove the business undertaking of that company say for example this we are talking of a paint uh, uh, a paint company uh, you know uh, paint making company now that paint making company could have two three divisions one division could be decorative paints another division could be industrial paints and the third could be, uh, say, just paint uh, the R and D of the paint painting division uh, for the required for the paint business. So we are talking of three divisions. Now, you, if you don't wish to continue in the in the say uh, decorative paint segment, you could sell that division, that business unit, on a going concern basis. You can either demerge that whole 
undertaking through a court process into another company or you could remove that division and spin it off uh, it's called a transfer of business unit you can you can just pick up that business unit and transfer that business unit outside the court scheme uh, to some other company this is uh, done through a uh, done to done through a uh, through an agreement called a business transfer agreement now these are the broad i would say uh, you know parameters or the broad process for doing any m and a transaction when you talk of a mergers or amalgamation the words used there are restructuring so it is not just transferring a business unit to another unit or not just transferring or merging one company to another company you could also do a capital restructuring of your company for example you are supposing your capital is quite large and you may want to restructure the capital you know bring it bring it less you you may want to uh, you know buy out the foreign collaborator or buy out any promoter or any partner or any investor you could still do that as a court scheme that also is possible therefore the word arrangement and compromise is used here in the, in the widest connotation or form so when we uh, friends when we talk of a merger or amalgamation really you know it's a it's it's a really really a vast subject that we are talking now every uh, every uh, every process that i mentioned to you just now in in 5 minutes ago whether it is a merger or an amalgamation or a share sale or a share sale a share, share, share sale or a transfer of unit transfer of demerger of a unit the, all this every uh, transaction has different set of regulations every transaction demands different type of treatment and every transaction demands a different set of skill sets to handle that transaction now this is friends i am just giving you a very birds overview birds eye and and just an overview of what what is contemplated in when you talk about any m and a transaction let's let's go to the current situation of covid covid situation what we what we are currently talking we are friends in a in a very un, let's pause for a minute on the regulatory front on mna and let's try to understand the covid situation currently so, and then uh, i i will again go back to the process driven and then merge uh, my views on on the scenarios uh, currently friends the, we are living in a very unprecedented situation the entire world is in a lockdown the businesses are completely shut um uh, in fact if you see the last year's uh, 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 the gdp of india itself was going down slowly the slowdown was already there and this covid has just put a complete lockdown globally on all the business business units and the, we, we are just facing an unprecedented situation we don't know friends again whether it is a first phase second phase or a third phase when will it open we don't nobody has any nobody can guess as to when will will we can really restore to the normalcy as we were experiencing secondly there is currently no data available as to how much is the loss uh, how much is going to take uh, to really start the businesses uh, whether the businesses will be will, will start full fledged whether what will happen so no there is just no idea whatsoever uh, globally uh, we are just speculating we are just guessing some numbers and as we go ahead and as as the day pass our guesses or our speculations may change now but one thing is certain and one thing is sure is that the consumer and consumer business centric businesses will immediately start uh, i mean whenever the lockdown is lifted the consumer or, or the products or companies will will pick up and will see some growth or will see action in the consumer space whereas the businesses which are which are of a luxurious nature or which which has a tour, a tourism travel uh, luxury buying or you know those businesses may, may uh, take some time to pick up that's the broad uh, having said this also suddenly i am seeing that uh, because of the of the the nature of this pandemic uh, the investments or other the focus of our attention of uh, the global uh, business or economy would go towards two sectors as i see one is digital business and second is healthcare uh, i i was just reading the the, the last week in nasdaq uh, just two three days back the nas there is a 0.8% growth recorded only in the digital space business which which covers facebook google amazon and the zoom uh, you know the, the software which we are we are, we are talking now so this digital businesses have added 0.8% of business on growth so you can just imagine this four or five companies have added huge growth to the nasdaq stock exchange on the other hand tele business tele tele marketing i, I mean uh, tele healthcare tele healthcare is also or or everything in the healthcare is going to really improve improve and is going to just grow 
I see a lot of investments going into the uh, digital space, digital businesses, and I also I see a lot of investments coming in the healthcare space. A lot of innovation will happen in healthcare space. Uh, on the business front, why I mentioned this because the entire M&A space or M&A work, whether it is legal, financial, or anything, is all always driven by the business requirement, the business need. And if you are planning to become a corporate lawyer and particularly uh, you're practicing in an m and space, uh, my earnest request uh, to all of you is going to be that you need to really understand business models, understand how businesses are structured, understand how businesses are conceived and how they grow, how they consolidate, how they expand, how they go into different markets. How do they? Uh, what are their what are their goals? Uh, and uh, when they when they pursue a new product or pursue or meet any new uh, enter into try to enter into a new jurisdiction, what are the challenges that they face? How does technology play a big role? Uh, technology plays or play a role in in uh, molding the or changing the business models. You need to understand all those stuff. Now, why I'm saying this, you need to understand because typically um, lawyers historically rather I would say. Lawyers felt that we are supposed to only talk of the regulatory framework. I, friends, gone are those days. I, I don't think so that lawyers uh, uh, it, who just know, understand the regulatory framework can really, really practice and practice in a very, I would say very strongly. Or you, uh, um, you can, uh, I would say that you know, you, if you really want to really, really be relevant uh, in the space of MNA you need to understand the business because whenever the discussions take place and if you are if you are blank about the business models like for example let me give an example when you talk of a digital business uh, say, take an example of any e retail company now do you know we, we you, you and me understand the retail company as just an app on the mobile phone and we go on the app and we buy some products and uh, we make digital payments and the delivery comes comes to us it's not that simple uh, the, the, the model of a retail company, particularly e-retail, is a complex model. Um, so uh, it, it essentially has a, has a it is a, essentially con contains a first a platform which is consumer facing. The first platform behind that platform, there is a huge technology company working to make the platform up and running. Uh, there's, there's a lot of and technology is not just one technology; it is not just one software. There are virtually multiple applications that they, the multiple plugins that they put in to make that app, make, make the uh, platform up and running. Uh, number one, behind that there are hundreds, virtually not just hundreds but thousands of various you know consumer agreements or sorry vendor agreements where they source the goods and and try to offer it uh, on the marketplace. And then on the to support the front end also there is a huge delivery chain. So when you look at the model of an e-retail company, you have a platform, you have a technology company supporting the, 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 the technology, the, the, the operations of the, of the platform. Then there are vendors, large number of vendors across the globe. It is not just the one, one uh, country supply, con, uh, supply chain uh, establishment. There's a huge sourcing department in any, any the success of the e-retail is how best and what best rate you can source the goods. Because the, the best the, the, the best rate that you can source, the, the, the more uh, you can offer discounts to the consumer. So you have to constantly source the best sources for supply of goods. So that's what happening on the one, one end. On the other end, there's a delivery channel. So these are the various structures. Now, if, you, if you're talking of selling of this company, just take an example, you're talking of merging this or selling this company to someone else. So what happens? It is, are you going to only sell the platform? Answer is no. What is expected is that you not only sell the platform, but you also sell the technology along with the platform. Mm -hmm. You sell the various contracts that you have entered into with the suppliers, the supply chain contracts. You also sell the delivery channels. Uh, to, to, so it, when, you, when, you, when you package the entire retail company for a merger, uh, to merge with someone else, you need to factor that, you need to make sure that the whole structure of this um, retail company is in place. Now, therefore, unless you understand what goes into the technology agreement, what goes into the vendor agreement, you will not be able to advise the company as to how should they structure uh, the uh, merger or amalgamation. Now, coming back again to the current situation. So currently, what is the situation? We have what will drive the MNA in the current space? 
so all those companies this are again this is this is not very rocket science but this is very basic of any uh, of any business i would say any company which is have which has a healthy balance sheet which has money at at disposal ex excess money at disposal they will want to acquire companies so they will be the acquirers to my mind primarily they would be acquirers companies who uh, or and if you have a strong balance sheet and if you you were eyeing some companies to consolidate your business you would also do m and a transaction that's another 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 uh, you know uh, i would say um, section of m and a companies may want to integrate with with their forward integration or with their down, downturn or up, upturn uh, competitors they may want to acquire the competitors they may also want to finish the competition they may want to combine synergies and and currently because the prices are down they and the companies which has huge balance sheet they may want to acquire those companies because of the covid situation the, the companies could be in financial stress as we know that there are a lot of companies in financial stress now they may have a good brand they may have good operations they may have good product they may have good fantastic balance sheet but currently they may they may they may not they may be in a financial stress so they may want to acquire uh, but they may they may be up for sale they may be up for some kind of stand some kind of a collaboration so we, we no it all depends upon what is your current state how long can you continue what are your long term what are your future plans so yeah these are the situation i would say uh, broad uh, uh, situations in the market which would either warrant an mna either a sell side or a buy side mna or or, or a restructuring for example you know i i just read somewhere not read but i was talking to someone yesterday there is a company uh, there is a large listed company which has two divisions one is a consumer division and another is industrial division the consumer di consumer division is doing extremely extremely well in the current situation but the industrial division is not doing well so they said look why, why not we just we just sell this undertaking because it it's it's a burden on the company and if we focus that our energies and focus our resources on the on the consumer it will be probably uh, we could yield better results so that's also another decision that they could take so it all depends upon what is your uh, what is your current uh, financial status current um, uh, business status and depending upon that any m and a transaction would be uh, triggered now uh, let me go back again to the to the to the basic presentation so when we when we talk of any m and a depending upon the business situation which i just now mentioned what is the starting point uh, what how, who approaches whom and how does any any m and a really really take starts taking shape so typically what happens depending upon the business requirement depending upon uh, what uh, the business goals are and depending upon the financial situation depending on n number of reasons the business houses take a take a call that yes we need to say for example sell or do some kind of an m and a transaction then the the, the most important part the second import, most important part that arises for consideration is the valuation of the company if you are want to buy someone or you want to sell someone what is the valuation that we are looking at that's where i see the first big challenge in the current situation uh, because in the current situation the the numbers of the companies are com the, they, we are facing a virtual lockdown this is a global lockdown so therefore the numbers may just not uh, be uh, just not you don't have the you may not have the numbers first of all to talk so you have to talk about the historical numbers that's number one second second biggest challenge is that uh if 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 you are let's take a hypothetical situation that you want to buy some company so let's proceed in the whole discussion about you are a buyer acquirer of a company and there is a there is a company which you want to acquire the 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 seller may quote say x rupees of price now you you will question that price saying that on what is the basis of your quoting the price the the basis has to be your up and running business the basis has to be your if you are listed company the listed price it has to be listed price now all those things may be absent currently so therefore question will be how do you really come up, come to a reasonable rational and fair price for doing that acquisition that's the to my mind that's the biggest and the first big challenge that you, any any acquirer is going to face added to that is currently if i if i estimate virtually most of the companies would have in some form violated their their primary or main contractual obligations whether it is lease agreements whether it is employee agreements whether it is shareholders agreement technology agreements there would have been some some form of default your first job is to uh, identify as to what happens with the default we are, will you will you be able to stay with the default will the company will be able to come out of the default what what exactly could happen 
so that's the that's the second second biggest challenge no you may want to acquire but these are the big big hurdles which you have to cross so what, what typically what happens is the parties discuss deliberate and i am assuming that despite all these odds they have come to some conclusion on the pricing and they have agreed on the pricing now that's the starting point the next starting point is that they would appoint uh, lawyers for doing of legal due diligence they would appoint uh, uh, financial due diligence uh, i mean accountants to do financial due diligence and uh, then the and and they will appoint probably some consultants depending upon the uh, if is the environmental uh, issue if the company has some environmental laws or obligations they will appoint uh, technicians to evaluate the impact of environment uh, they would appoint technical other technical experts uh, and um, and they would start to assess the comp- assess the nature of the company once that is done the next stage is to prepare a term sheet and then agree on the format of on which you need to do the mna so as i as i as, as i mentioned in the beginning uh, the format could be either you may acquire the company through court process or you may acquire that company through a share sale agreement or you may want to acquire just the business unit as a business transfer agreement so these are the various forms in which you could do it as a lawyer again your first assignment would be or the the, the first requirement would be to do a legal due diligence on the company now that is where i think the first uh, your technical skill gets skills gets tested uh, so in any mna transaction the the key is doing the perfect due diligence in fact i would say it is not just the in the mna space but also in any space uh, carrying out or conducting a due diligence uh, whether you are a seller acquirer or whoever you represent is a very very serious exercise due diligence is a is a tiring exercise it's a longish exercise but it's also is it is that exercise the word diligence itself means that you have to be extraordinarily diligent and unfortunately uh, um, there are there, there is a view or there is a school of thought that look due diligence is supposed to be done by very junior lawyers and therefore seniors don't get involved and i don't subscribe to that view at all i feel due diligence is is the most exercise most important exercise uh, one has to do and there is no you just can't slip have any slippages in, in the due diligence you just can't ignore certain things you have to be very very diligent the word itself suggests you have to be diligent and you have to pay an extra extra effort you have to put in extra effort to make sure that you identify all the issues in the due diligence now why is that i is that because when we tomorrow when we go for a, for the process when we go for the documentation or when you go for uh doing the uh, completion uh, legal formalities at that time if you come to know that oh something was missed out in the due diligence you would you would not uh, you know excuse yourself uh, and the clients would get terribly upset and once i have i have done tons of uh, due diligences and i can share you with my experience by touch wood by god's grace everything went all 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 well but i know ex- instances where on the other side there were slippages on due diligence and and their clients had to pay huge price on on the due diligence because they because they were not diligent so due diligence is an exercise i would say which is a very serious exercise uh, i just spent 2 uh, 3 minutes or more on the due diligence exercise uh, when we when a legal dd is conducted i would strongly recommend that you need to get associated with the financial uh, consultants also and the management also you know it is is a combined exercise you can't do a legal dd in isolation the better if you want the better results i think it, it a consolidated exercise or the as a coordinated exercise is is much much more better that's number one number two understanding the business requirements is very critical you must sit with the clients uh, understand the business models understand try to read how the business are structured understand from the client as to what is looking at uh, when when you should get a proper business brief uh, debriefing from the clients if you get a proper briefing from the client it will become easier for you to uh, put your head uh, head together and and uh, and focus on the right issues and uh, like for example if if the acquire, the company which you are acquiring for example if that company's strength is say brands so your focus should be to do a complete proper legal deal, uh, i mean check on the title of the brands the registration whether there is infringement whether there is any any cases pending on the brand so the the main asset what you are acquiring you really need to focus on asset supposing that company has a huge real estate and the, our client or the acquirer is really eyeing at the at the real estate 
So obviously, you have to be very, very careful in doing the title search of the of title search of the real estate of the of the selling company uh, because without which you just can't do an acquisition. If the title has a problem, then what's the point of paying the money because when the title is in question? Uh, thirdly, supposing that company has a huge distribution network, uh, you know, for example, it could be just a, having a large set of distributors. Your question will be whether whether that company has distribution agreements in place and whether those agreements are really really properly executed agreements. What happens if, if post merger, if, whether there are clauses in the distribution agreement which gets triggered, which gets terminated because of the merger. So all these things, depending on the asset that you are acquiring, you really need to be very careful about what exactly you are acquiring and whether that asset is, is post merger going to come seamlessly to you and full title is going to waste with you or not. That's the bottom line. Currently, there is a uh, there is a trend of doing due diligence on uh, due diligence on a virtual data room. That's not a bad because we have will have to I, I guess uh, you know accept the fact that we'll have to uh, do virtual data room uh, DD, but that's not very efficient way of doing it. Uh, at least I insist the client that look virtual data room will do it, but on certain documentation I will I still insist that I need to see physical copies and it go through it and do my own uh, you know diligence. Uh, the next point is once you, you are through the due diligence, uh, then the next next issue comes is of the executing a term sheet or executing preparing the first first set of documentation. Uh, typically, I always recommend that in any m &A or any transaction that you do, you must execute a short uh, and a, a sharp term sheet or a, what you call as a as a memorandum of agreement. I may say uh, this should this MOU should be or a term sheet should be should be comprehensively drafted, correctly drafted, keeping in mind the business requirements of the parties. This, it may not, it may not have all the legal uh, aspect mentioned in that, but commercially what both parties wants to achieve, want to achieve, I think it is extremely important that you capture everything in the term sheet. Typically in, in m &A process, what happens is if you are doing a court process m &A, you may not, you may start drafting this, that drafting the scheme, which goes in the court of law. But I, I, I would such recommend that in, in that situation also, whether you go for a non, uh, whether court process or you go for a non-court process, I think before you enter into this kind of transaction, it is always advisable to enter into a short MOU or a term sheet, which captures correctly what are you planning to do through that MNA. I, I, either you are, either you are the, the description of the asset, description of the price. Um, and, and all the facets which which really you want to capture. So everything that that term it is better to spend some time, some good time in the in, in identifying and drafting the term sheet so that uh, you know you capture all the aspect of, of the transaction and then move from there. Uh, keep a scope for modifying modifying the term sheet also if required, but that becomes a reference document. So and, and when we're talking of a uh, friends, when we're talking of M and A situation. The process goes on for some time. Uh, if we are talking of a court process M &A, in a listed space, the span of the the transaction span could could uh, could now uh, you know maybe it also one year or more than a year. So you are talking of you know working on various taking various steps and and in one year is a very big period. So a lot of things could change. A lot of things could surprise you. So in that situation, the term sheet becomes a mother document where you can refer. Uh, any issues that arise uh, during the uh, during the uh, implementation of the m and and you could uh, refer and, and resolve any conflicting issues that may arise during the m and scheme. So that's the uh, that's the that's the beginning of the process, I would say. Apart from due diligence and the term sheet, the third most important part that you need to factor in, in doing any m and are the regulatory approvals. Uh, say, for example, you are you are working on a on a transaction or, or you're trying to acquire a company which has uh, some technology uh, licenses agreements from some key people or some brand licensing from some third party brand licensing now your question you, your focus has to be that post the merger or post my acquisition the key asset which i which i just referred some time back whether my key asset is going to be going to remain with me or not so therefore you will have to really the next step I, I would say is as soon as your due diligence is over, during the due diligence, you need to identify uh, how, what the nature of the asset and nature of permissions that you need to take to acquire those assets. For example, if you are talking of uh, acquiring a, a company which has brands, which are licensed from some third party. So your first question will be because of the merger, 
will the trademark license agreements or the brand license agreement gets terminated or not and you need to study the terms and conditions of the of the brand license agreement i recently i mean, I mean we have done several of these kind of uh, mergers uh, where where um, this this kind of issues arise but very recently when i did a with acquisition where uh, it, it, it was a very huge large you know mnc brand but it was licensed from third party so we went to the to the licensor the third party licensor and we told them that look we are under because the seller is 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 having a financial difficulty and they would like to sell it the brand or sell the company to us now person to that sale that brand license agreement would also should also stand transferred to us or should come to us i mean as an acquirer and uh, that agreement had a clause that look if there is a change in control then the agreement stands terminated or they need to take a permission from the licensor so we went to the licensor upfront in advance before doing any documentation we went to the you know, we went to the licensor requested them that look you know the company is doing very well but um, because of xyz reasons they they can't continue right now with the with the existing um, uh, the the resources they need additional resources therefore they have proposed a merger and post merger the brand would really expand because our clients had a huge distribution network and and the, the, the licensor agreed with that he said look yeah keep my terms and conditions the same terms and conditions and we don't mind executing a fresh agreement fresh license agreement post the acquisition so the the post due diligence uh, once you do the due diligence you need to really identify what are the licenses permissions some specific covenants what are what are the speed breakers or what are what are what are these important milestones that need to be captured or covered uh, before we start the process of mna so once you once you uh, once you are identified once you identify the road of doing uh, the road map of achieving those uh, milestones you can then commence the process of doing an mna now this also includes a uh, permission from the competition commission i will not go into the competition law i will not go into the various other laws now, for example typically uh, till such time if you are acquiring any uh, say bank you need a rbi permission if you need to acquire a telecom company you need to permission from the telecom authorities if you need to acquire an nbfc you need to have permission from the reserve bank of india so uh, regulatory permissions are also key if you are acquiring a, a plant and machinery which is located in midc you need to get permission from the midc or, or if it is gujarat it is gidc so various statutory permissions contractual permissions contractual licenses that you have uh, you need to identify whether you need to take permissions from from those various authorities uh, the next uh, next is so now you are ready to do the the merger now again friends i am not going to go into the details of the court process merger nor am i going to do the, do go into detail about the our the the non court process merger but i'll just take you take you through the broad process Uh, when we when we talk of a merger or amalgamation and when we talk of a court process merger or amalgamation there are a couple of point which i want you to factor in and here i must mention this that uh, fortunately the jurisprudence that is given that is that got developed in india uh, with regard to the mergers or acquisition is is so uh, so fortunate that we, we that, that the entire jurisprudence is so uniform uh, across india uh, whether it is bombay high court whether it is gujarat high court or whether it is supreme court the jurisprudence has been all uh, nicely laid down and uh, we must really thank our courts for uh, for supporting the whole process of mna i would say this is the only sec- sec- area of of law where the courts are extremely consistent on their various views you know i i i just don't see any contradictory judgment or or any judgment which has which has really a uh, place something which is which is not uh, which is not uh, which is beyond the business requirements Uh, the first uh, i would say the, the and as a students i would I, i would request that you please look at two judgments one is the uh, tata tomko liver judgment of supreme court and and tomko liver judgment uh, uh, the case case law is uh, 1994 four company law journal 267 now there are two judgments of the of the bombay high court uh, of the start tomko liver judgment one is of the bombay high court is bombay high court when they when they the division bench has passed a very elaborate judgment which which was challenged in the supreme court but both the judgments you need to really need to read need to read the judgments of the bombay high court and also of the supreme court because the law which is laid down by bombay and also supreme court it is complementary and the, the the explanation is quite really brilliant so for any student of mna now i would say that 
the first and foremost thing what you should do is you must get hold of these two judgment decisions one is the uh, tom, tom ko lever judgment of 1994 and mihir mafatlal uh, which followed the tom ko lever uh, which of 1996 uh, 87 company cases page number 792 mihir mafatlal also is a fantastic supreme court judgment so these two judgments really are the landmark judgments and these both these judgments have answered most of the questions which normally arise in any mna and uh, the explanation that is given by supreme court is really wonderful and uh, i would be uh, i would be reading out some some of the uh, judgments to, uh, to you now the first question which which really comes to our mind is uh, uh, or rather your mind will be as whenever whenever a scheme goes to court uh, court of law how should the what is the what is the scope that the court should look at uh, how does the court look at any scheme and and, and i'm talking of any scheme it is not just uh, the merger or amalgamation but any scheme because as i mentioned to you right in the beginning that when we talk of merger or amalgamation the various transactions the weird these are the you know multiple transactions but the process is same it is all called a merger or amalgamation or a scheme of reconstruction or scheme of a compromise now all these schemes when you look at uh, when the courts look at the scheme uh, the the supreme court has very nicely mentioned in the mir mafatlal judgment it says that the court should act like a umpire in a game of cricket Uh, who has to see both team both the teams play their game according to the rules and do not overstep the limits but subject to that how best the game is to be played is left to the players and not to the umpire now this will really give you some idea as to how supreme court views a scheme of arrangement or a, a scheme of merger or amalgamation when it comes to the court of law supreme court has and and time and again most of the courts have said we will not entertain will not try to interfere in the commercial judgment of the parties because it's again it's a when the two companies decide to merge with each other or or do some kind of restructuring it's as a commercial decision courts have have least role to play in in the whole scheme uh, so that's the view of the supreme court in fact in the uh, in the uh, mir mafatlal's case supreme court has uh, given some 13 contours as to um, uh, what how the court should look at uh, the Uh, scheme of merger or amalgamation. Just give me a minute. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in fact, the uh, just prior to this, the Gujarat High Court in the case of Navjivan Mills, 42 company cases, page number 265. I'll read out to you the, that paragraph, which will give you really the correct uh, way of how court should look at. And this is how the court have interpreted. The court says the scheme should not be examined in a way a carping carping critic, a hair splitting expert. or a meticulous accountant or a fastidious counsel would do it it must be tested from the point of view of an ordinary reasonable shareholder acting in a business like manner taking with his comprehension and bearing in mind all the circumstances prevailing at the time when the meeting was called upon to consider the scheme in question it has it has to ascertain that the majority vote has honestly obtained or has been honestly obtained that the majority acted honest honestly that no financial or arithmetic jugglery was perpetuated either upon the creditors or the shareholders this is this is what uh, you know the uh, this is what the court uh, has stated the gujarat high court has stated uh, about the role of a court when when they scrutinize a scheme similarly there is a very interesting judgment uh, of the chancery division english court Uh, it is in the sussex bricks company limited reported in 1960 uh, 30 company cases i'll again read out to you that paragraph because it is very interesting uh, that paragraph it says that although it might be possible to find faults in a scheme that would not be sufficient ground to reject it scheme must be obviously unfair patently unfair unfair to the meanest intelligence it cannot be said that no scheme can be effective to bind a dissenting shareholder unless it complies to the extent of 100% it is the consistent view of the courts that no scheme can be said to be foolproof and it is possible to find faults in a particular scheme but that by itself is not enough to warrant a dismissal of a petition for sanction of the scheme the courts have gone further to say that a scheme must be held to be unfair to the meanest intelligence before it can be rejected it must be affirmatively proved to the satisfaction of the court that a scheme is unfair before the scheme can be rejected now as i mentioned to the supreme court in the case of mir mafatlal uh, uh, 87 company cases uh, 792 has made some very interesting observations which i mentioned to you and there are 13 contours which the supreme court has uh, given on on the on on basis of what the supreme court should really 
consider a scheme of merger or amalgamation. The Supreme Court has the Mir Mafazal judgment. It says uh, that the, however, the further question remains whether the court has jurisdiction like an appellate authority to minutely scrutinize the scheme and to arrive at an independent conclusion whether the scheme should be permitted or go through, uh, permitted to be could go through or not when the majority of the creditors or members or the respective classes have approved. On this aspect, it's very important that what, what uh, I'll just read out what the Supreme Court says. It says, the court says, the court has neither the expertise nor the jurisdictions to dwell deep, dwell deep into the commercial wisdom exercised by the creditors or the members of the company who have ratified the scheme by requisite majority. Consequently, the company court's jurisdiction to the extent is peripheral and supervisory and not appellate. This is, this is very important. Uh, you know, friends, it, it takes, I would say, I must compliment the Supreme Court for saying, you know, being so bold to, to say that, uh, uh, that we, our jurisdiction on a scheme is merely peripheral. Our, our role is supervisory and not an appellate. Uh, and then it goes on to say that the court acts like an empire in a game of cricket who has to see that both the teams play their uh, game according to the rules and not overstep the limits and reject. The next most important question then comes is about the valuation. Now this is, uh, this is, this is the uh, most uh, mostly debated and mostly argued point of law on what should be the correct valuation. Again, friends, I must really compliment the Supreme Court and various courts here. Uh, to say that, look, they have they have never interfered in the valuation. All that they say, and I just read out to you the, that paragraph which talks, uh, which which is from the uh, Tom Colliver judgment. And again, in that judgment, if you see, they, they have referred to various other judgments of the various courts. And th there's a consistent view by the various courts on on the scheme of merger or amalgamation in when it comes to valuation. I'll read out to you that paragraph, which is very important. The jurisdiction of the court in sanctioning any merger is not to ascertain with mathematical accuracy whether the valuation satisfies the arithmetical test or not. A company court does not exercise any an appellate jurisdiction. It is not required to interfere only because the figures arrived at by a valuer was not a better as it would have been if another method would have been adopted. What is imperative is that such determination should have should not have been contrary to law and that it was not unfair to the shareholders of the company which was being merged. The court's obligation is to be satisfied that valuation was in accordance with law and it was carried out by an independent body. Now comes the very interesting paragraph of Supreme Court. And I must, again, I, I repeat, and I have been saying this for several years that we must compliment the Supreme Court for having given this, this very bold decision and bold observation about their own capability when it comes to examining a issue of valuation. The Supreme Court says, Certainly, it is not part of the judicial process to examine entrepreneurial activities to ferret out flaws. The court is least equipped for such oversights, nor indeed it is a function of the judges in our constitutional scheme. We do not think that the internal management, business activity or institutional operation of public bodies can be subjected to inspection by the court. To do so is incompetent and improper and therefore out of bounds. So Supreme Court has, in so many words, said that, look, we are not competent. When it comes to valuation, you know, every, uh, every major m and is, is always challenged on the issue of valuation. And the courts are saying that, look, we are not competent. The courts are saying we are not, uh, we are, it, it's not our jurisdiction to find out whether the valuation is correct or not. So long as the valuation is done scientifically, so long as the valuation is done by an independent body, it, it, that, that's more than sufficient. That's what the Supreme Court has, has said. And I, I think, you know, this, this virtually has set at rest uh, the, the position, uh, position of the court uh, jurisdiction on valuation. Then next comes is the, uh, uh, the question was about employees. Uh, when we merge one company to other company, and if you are, whether whether if you are, whether you are going to reduce the employment, whether employees, whether what happens, what happens with the issue? So typically, what we provide in any scheme is that the the, the terms and conditions of the company which is being merged. Say for example, in your company, the terms and conditions are say X terms and conditions, and in, in and with the with the other company, the terms and conditions are Y terms and conditions. All that is required is you need to continue with the same terms and conditions. 
you you can't change the terms and you can you can make them better but you can't you know deteriorate the terms and condition that is what is that is what is expected from the from the code uh, from the uh, scheme <clears throat> so um, uh, coming back again to the question uh, in in the tom collier merger employees union had objected to the merger saying that look the terms and terms are not correct they are not fair so therefore they wanted to object to it supreme court again got down <clears throat> got down and said supreme court observed scheme of amalgamation cannot be faulted on an apprehension because there in during that merger it, it was apprehended that because of the merger there will be excess of employment and some some people may lose their employment so therefore this merger is not in the interest of the employees and therefore it must be rejected that was the contention of the employees union and to that supreme court observed that look scheme of amalgamation cannot be faulted on an apprehension and speculation as to what might possibly happen in future improved technology and scientific method results in better employment prospects anxiety should be to protect workers and not to obstruct development and growth maybe see this is very interesting and this is a very i would say a progressive judgment by the supreme court it, it is so progressive you know it really really i think it is creates a fantastic precedent for labor laws uh, for labor courts the supreme court says maybe that advancement advanced technology may reduce manpower but so long as those who are working are protected they are not entitled to hinder in modernization or merger under misapprehension that future employment of the same number of workers may stand curtail now i i don't think so any 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 anyone can find fault with this judgment and as we see in fact if you if you this judgment is of 1996 if you see the technical technical uh, technological advancement that has happened in the last uh, 10 15 years it is possible uh, like uh, if you take an example of uh, banking business the banking business has improved but the employment has not improved they not increased the way it, should, it ought to have been increased because of technology we have atm machines now all over the places you don't need to go into the branch offices now therefore the court is saying that look because of advancement of technologies employment employments employment get reduced but there will be there could be new employments in the in the newer newer age, newer area so that we need to protect and we can't hinder just because on an apprehension that was because of the post merger employ employments employments uh, may lose employees may lose their employment because of those apprehensions you can't question the uh, question the uh, uh, merger very interesting question was raised in the in the tom collier merger and that was uh, the question was uh, Uh, it was the merger of uh, the uh, division of uh, uh, tomco into hindustan liver hindustan liver the shareholding of livers was 51% and post merger the, the the shareholding of the liver the parent company was reducing so they had they had issued some preferential shares to the to the parent company and thereby restored back their 51% the question was what happens if, if can you increase the shareholding of a foreign parent company through the merger scheme and if they increase it will it will amount to it will it will be against the public policy uh, public interest that, that that was being challenged by some at that time some uh, some uh, uh, public shareholders or whatever again supreme court came uh, very heavily and uh, supreme court has given a fantastic uh, concept it says i'll i'll just read out you know it's so brilliant every time i read i really enjoy the reading of that that paragraph it says the concept of public interest cannot be put into straight jacket it is a dynamic concept which keeps on changing it has been explained in black laws dictionary as something in which public the community at large has some pecuniary interest or some interest by which their legal rights or liabilities are affected it does not mean anything so narrow as mere curiosity where whereas the interest of a particular locality may be affected by the let, by by the letters in question interest cared by citizen generally in affairs of local or state government it is an expression of widest amplitude it may be may have different connotation and understanding when used in service law and yet different meaning in criminal law than civil law and it had made it it may be entirely different in company law but when it when it is with subsidiary of foreign company the consideration may be entirely different it is not the interest of shareholders or employees only but the interest of society which may have to be examined and a scheme valid and good may yet be bad if it is against public policy at the end it says in amalgamation of companies the courts have evolved the principle of prudent business management test or that the scheme should not be devised to evade law but when the court is concerned with the scheme of merger with the subsidiary of foreign company 
and the test is not only where the scheme shall result in maximizing profit of a shareholders or whether the interest of employees was protected but it was has to be ensure that merger shall not result in impeding promotion of industry or shall obstruct growth of national economy liberalized economic policy is to achieve that goal and further it says uh, we do not think that public interest which is uh, it is not part of the judicial process to examine entrepreneurial activities to ferret out flaws the court is leaks equipped to such oversights nor indeed it is the function of judges in our constitutional schemes so court says that look just because uh, just because the one shareholder has increased its you know as a consequence of the merger it increases its shareholding doesn't mean it is against the public policy you need to understand that the whole the impact of whole merger is to protect the economy and follow the uh, follow the uh, foreign investment policy of the of, uh, announced at that point of time so that was the that was the role played by the supreme court i mean that was the view taken by supreme court which is to my mind so progressive view so progressive view that uh, you know no matter now whatever changes may happen in in future uh, but those the, the, those two judgments will remain uh, the guiding guiding principle for any mna in even in india then friends coming to uh, the role of objection objection to central government typically if whenever a scheme of merger or amalgamation goes to the court of law the regional director or the ministry of corporate affairs uh, and now the the notices have to go to various other departments as well they raise typical questions you know about valuations about lot of they raise lot of questions now fortunately dr chandra tre was one of the one of the greatest uh, uh, commentator on companies act and uh, and a company secretary and a lawyer very senior company secretary he had done a very uh, very nice study for uh, for all the objections raised by various uh, rocs during 1965 to 1996 and uh, he classified the various objections raised by the government by the rocs into 35 different categories and friends you will be very surprised to uh, hear this that the analysis suggests that 98% of those objections were rejected by the courts so you can imagine that uh, this the fate of uh, the fate of uh, the objections which are raised by the government uh, so friends uh, with this uh, you know i i have just given you a broad overview of the uh, mna process and the jurisprudence that uh, the court exercises or the jurisprudence what is laid down by the court when they look at any mna scheme again just to recap mna can be classified uh, rather rather categorized into two for two parts one is a listed space and unlisted space number one then comes the further classification of the nature of transactions so an mna can be done through court process or to through can be done without the court process i mean outside the court process uh, mna it doesn't mean only a merger or an amalgamation mna encompasses within its scope a merger amalgamation scheme of reconstruction scheme of compromise between the company between the creditors between the company and its shareholders between the company and its specific identified shareholders one part of mna could be hiving of the divisions which are also called as demergers you could do outside the court scheme by way of a share transfer agreement you could do transfer and division by way of a business transfer agreement you could just make acquire the shares of the company and make it a subsidiary or you could sell your shares so these are all various type of transactions which fall within the within the broad category of mergers and amalgamations and as i said uh you need if you really need to practice and you need to be successful as a corporate lawyer the first and foremost thing is friends and this is for i would i would rather spend five more minutes and in, in some detail you really need to be aware of the business realities you need to be aware of the economic condition of the businesses what are the new businesses which are getting developed uh you know currently uh, dig- digital business is very much into into discussion Uh, digital businesses the the, the the retail business e retail businesses the financial uh, uh, financial system, fintech companies the startup uh, uh, new ventures so historically we were typically looking at chemical companies pharma companies manufacturing companies automotive automobile companies or consumer companies in addition to that now there is a huge new breed of companies or new breed of businesses which are got developed which includes fintech companies which includes as i mentioned retail companies so you need to understand the business models of these companies understand what happens in that business globally today you know if you really do bit bit, bit of proper search 
you can you can really make out the trends that would come in 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 the various businesses and the trends will then dictate whether you will be doing and what kind of we are talking of ma in in that space so i would think as a corporate lawyer you really really need to understand 50% of your time you must spend time in understanding the regulatory process and 50% of your time you need to spend in understanding the business models you need to understand financial statements you need to understand the uh, the best way to understand any business to my mind is if you can go to the uh, to the stock exchange um, uh, filings you read a prospectus of any business the prospectus will give you the business model prospectus will give you the key contracts prospectus will give you the key risk associated with the business so if you read the business model given in any prospectus of any company you will not only understand that company but you will also understand that that business model there there is a section called as risk associated with any any businesses which is already always given in the, in the prospectus and i would honestly request that before you end, adventure into any mna or start studying or parallelly maybe you could pick up couple of prospectors of some good companies and see their public doc prospectors and see their description of business their structure of the business their shareholders uh, their shareholders agreement you know even they give major the, the key key uh, elements of the shareholders agreement or some major contract so you need, you can see that also so studying a prospectors of any company uh, listed company gives you a really good insight into a commercial layering or commercial business model a uh, business model of that uh, corporation or that company and also good understanding of that business model so understanding that is very critical a number one number two you also need to read read you, you have to be very thorough and updated with the latest what's happening in the in the corporate world you can't say that look oh as and when the matter comes to me i'll read no you have to develop that sense of uh, of uh, urgency to read and update yourself on the commercial commercial world what's happening that's number number 2 now uh, with with that you also need to you know be tra track uh, you know um, track all the latest updates vis a vis the corporate laws now friends when i started my career in 1988 89 at that time we had only companies act 1956 that's it we sebi did was not there sebi there was nothing no there was no word like sebi sebi came in 1992 so uh, i i would say my batch is a is a batch of fortunate lawyers that we could see in 1991 we saw the the liberalization policy being unveiled step by step basis in 1991 by dr manmohan singh who was the then finance minister and uh, uh, narsimha rao was the prime minister of the country so we could see uh, in 1991 onwards we saw the foreign investment policy 92 we saw sebi 94 sebi came up with a take over code first take over code which was uh, revised in 1997 then came in 1999 fera was replaced by fema regulations then came the competition competition laws and <coughs> then came the banking regulations then came the insurance regulatory authority irda came uh, uh, so gradually in the last 20 years we have seen lot of changes in the regulatory framework and i would say again i must say very humbly i must say that my batch of law, my my batch has seen all this development very step by step and very gradually so we could understand that now for you or someone like you who has just passed out or who is on the process of getting passed out and to become a corporate lawyer you have to work very hard friends you will have to really go through unless you understand the basics of all this various uh, regulatory framework to say that yes i i can advise or i to, to dare to say that yes, i am a corporate lawyer and i would i would practice in mna is is a very tough ch challenging uh, question i would say so but uh, nothing nothing to worry you know uh, like uh, i studied 1956 act and now in 2013 we had to undergo complete rechange and restudy the now new companies act so we had done that in fact it is just that we got to study all these various laws step by step basically so you have to do it up front but again having said this i must also say that during my time there was no internet there was no google so we could not search or uh, do any search we had to physically uh, uh, maintain papers we physically maintain files documents and study them today everything is on the tip of the tip of your hand on a mobile phone you get all the laws and regulations so the ease of uh, ease of learning also is is equally there available to you so mm -hmm. i i guess you know it's not very difficult it's a fantastic branch of law and it is only going to increase it is only going to expand and uh i would uh, uh, invite uh, um, uh, all those who have a commercial commercial sense and commercial mind to become corporate lawyers and particularly practice in the in the space of uh, mna uh, i i have seen the first wave of foreign investment in in the 90s uh, 1991 to 9, 2000 
I, I am and because of this pandemic, uh, my gut feeling is that we may see a second round of uh, foreign investment coming in uh, in the next decade, and India will be the preferred destination for foreign investment. So we may again see a, 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 a again a spate of uh, M&A activities and a lot of MNCs coming in India, either uh, on their own or consolidating their businesses, or they do they they may do acquire businesses. So. I, I guess there is a lot of opportunity, but at the same time, the burden and the hard work is huge here. Uh, friends, I have tried to broadly cover up the, the process, but it, it, in, in one hour's time, I, I don't think so. I can do any more justice to this subject. See when except to say that it's an interesting subject and, uh, and uh, the more you study, uh, the more you'll enjoy that subject. With Geo being the golden baby for VC funds currently, can you explain the hurdles that RIL would face while going through the process of a demerger in order to structure Geo Telecom to go public as an independent entity? I, I don't think so. They have, uh, they have uh, you, uh, you know, uh, announced the demerger of their uh, of their Geo entity, so it will be premature for us to really comment upon that. Uh, the next one is post-COVID, if Chinese companies try to acquire a lot of indigenous companies, what strategy does a government have for the same and does a country's foreign policy restrict FDI in the event of a pandemic or encourage the same? If you Are see, the legal procedures for m and by foreign companies the same as the ones for indigenous? Uh, uh, no, the pro provisions are not same. Uh, but very recently, just I think two weeks back, government has come out with the press note number three, I think, of this you know, 2020, and where they have said that any investment which comes from the neighboring country is going to be scrutinized by the government is not under automatic route. So any investment coming from China is, I guess, is not under automatic route, and it will need specific permission from the government. As an intern, how can one initiate the process of due diligence while working in a law firm, and what should one look into before starting? Oh, as an intern, you are, you, you, you'll be guided by your senior. <laughs> Currently, there is enough material available on due diligence. And I, I, I'm glad someone asked this question. <clears throat> there is enough material available on the net. Please study that material. Due diligence is not a simple, easy exercise. Please take it seriously. And the more you get into the due diligence, the more you will, you will enjoy that subject. Uh, sir, do you think there will be a chance of increase in M&A post-COVID? since most of the companies would be on the verge of bankruptcy or decreased growth. Yes. Is there a chance of... Yes, absolutely. Growth? See, uh, I would say MNA, Surita, you know, honestly, whether it, whether we are in a pre-COVID or post-COVID, MNA is always, always going to remain. MNA never, in my, in my 26, 27 years of career, I have never seen MNA going down. Whether it is financial crisis of 2008 or the current pandemic crisis, I would think m a is such an activity which you see, every company will want to survive. And so the survival will depend upon what are your resources and what are your businesses. And if your resources are not there or your business is not sufficient or if you want to increase your business, you have to, you have to undergo an m a activity. There is no other choice.